There have been two components of the Israeli war in Gaza, backed fully by the United States, armed and funded by the United States, that we have been reporting on since October 7th. One is the war itself, which we will get to in a minute, since it barely has any attention anymore, even though Israel continues to destroy major parts of Gazan civilian infrastructure, using U.S. bombs and weapons to kill enormous amounts of innocent people. Even though people aren't looking quite as much, they're concerned about whether Democrats are going to win. You have all these Democrats who have been accusing Joe Biden of genocide for the last nine months, and suddenly their only concern is no longer the genocide in Gaza they've been accusing him of perpetrating, but how to help him or his party stay in power. But the other component behind the war itself is the effects that the war is having inside the United States, specifically the severe crackdown cheered on and demanded and imposed by pro-Israel cheerleaders in the United States on people who criticize Israel inside the United States, who exercise the right to oppose and protest against the Israeli war in Gaza or our government's funding and arming of it, or people who support the Palestinian cause. We have constantly re reported on the numerous ways that laws have been passed to severely constrain the free speech rights of American citizens when it comes to Israel and Israel alone. All of the different measures that Congress has taken to demand that colleges change their curriculum and take all sorts of administrative steps to eliminate the kinds of speech that members of Congress dislike because they say it makes Jewish students unsafe to have to be exposed to it. We reported on the mass firings in media and politics and journalism and all sorts of other sectors of people who have criticized Israel in a way deemed excessive. The boycott campaign by billionaires to prevent people from entering the industry of hedge funds or other high finance if they are found guilty of denouncing Israel, this foreign country, or its crimes or its war effort in Gaza. Just a continuous stream of repression and attacks on the free speech rights, on the employment rights, on the civil liberties of American citizens as punishment for criticizing this foreign country and just that foreign country and that country alone. I'm not going to repeat all the things we reported, but I just want to instead report on some of the latest and most disturbing new escalations of these crackdowns because they continue to escalate even while people aren't paying attention. First of all, here from the New York Times, Reporting yesterday, Columbia, the university in uh, New York, removes three deans saying that their tax touched on, quote, anti-Semitic tropes. That's three deans at Columbia punished, reassigned, moved out of their office for supposedly engaging in speech that was, quote, un unacceptable and deeply upsetting to Jewish students. That's what the president of the university said. The Mat Shafiq, the university president, called the sentiments in the tax message, quote, unacceptable and deeply upsetting. Now, I'm sure you remember, as I do, how essentially everybody on the American right who identified as conservative or just sort of anti-woke has made this cause their primary issue for the last decade mocking college students who demand to be protected from ideas they find disturbing, viciously condemning the notion that academics and scholars and uh, administrators should lose their jobs for expressing views simply because they're unpopular on college campus. Remember, that was called cancel culture. That was called, called censorship. Everyone in the American right hated it. Barry Weiss and Dave Rubin and Ben Shapiro all built very lucrative careers pretending to champion the cause of free discourse. And yet now you have the most significant and extreme crackdown and attack on free speech over the last nine months that I've seen in many decades that involve private sector jobs, academia, scholarship, the ability of professors to teach things and say things, and even implemented laws themselves, like we've reported on many times, that are designed to punish people for their speech if they're found to be anti-Semitic. Not if they're found to be racist, not if they're found to be misogynistic, not if they're found to be Islamophobic, not if they're found to be homophobic or transphobic. The right thinks it's absurd to try and police speech on those grounds. But on this ground, all the principles get abandoned and everything inverts. So let's look at exactly what these 
professors were punished for doing. Three Columbia University administrators have been removed from their post after sending text messages that, quote, disturbingly touched on ancient anti-Semitic tropes during a forum about Jewish issues in May, according to a letter sent by Columbia officials to the university community on Monday. Now, this has been what, quote, woke ideology has been about, getting people fired for being adjacent to or implying tropes that are racist, homophobic, transphobic, Islamophobic, xenophobic, etc. And everyone who proclaimed they were anti-woke was indignant about this. This is the same exact framework. It's just applied to a group that those people who have been making that their cause have more empathy for or more affection for. And in this case, it's not speech that they like that's being targeted when it's very easy to denounce it. It's speech they dislike that's being targeted, and now suddenly they cheer it. Quote, the three Columbia administrators involved in the text message exchanges are Kristen Chrome, formerly the Dean of Undergraduate Student Life, Matthew Patachnik, formerly the Associate Dean for Student and Family Support, and Susan Cheng Kim, formerly the Vice Dean and Chief Administrative Officer. I believe at least one, if not two, of those punished deans are themselves Jewish. We'll check on that, but I know that at least one is. The administrators are still employed by the university, but have been placed on indefinite leave and will not return to their previous jobs. The university also announced on Monday that beginning this fall, Columbia students, faculty, and staff will undergo required anti-discrimination training that will include a focus on anti-Semitism. I don't think anything has provoked the rage and disgust of the American right more over the last decade than re-education programs designed to cleanse people of prohibited ideas or discriminatory ideas. But training people, retraining them, re-educating them about anti-Semitism, that, of course, is incredibly noble. Quote, on March 31st, in the aftermath of student protest and congressional hearings called to address anti-Semitism on college campuses, Columbia hosted during its reunion weekend a panel discussion called Jewish Life on Campus, Past, Present, and Future. The panel speakers included Brian Cohen, the executive director of Columbia Barnard Hillel, the Jewish Students Organization. And we, of course, uh, had Lee Fang on to report on the financial connection between Hillel and the Israeli government. It also included David Scheitzer, the former dean of the law school and a chair of the university administration, the university's anti-Semitism task force. The three administrators and Dr. Sorat were in the audience. And a person sitting behind Ms. Chang Kim photographed the text message she was exchanging with her colleagues. These were private text messages, not even public statements. And somebody creeped behind them and took photographs of their text messages. And then, quote, the images of those conversations were shared with the Washington Free Beacon, a conservative website which published an article about them. Now, the Washington Free Beacon is one of the, you could go back a decade and find hundreds of articles mocking and denouncing university students for demanding that people be fired for racist views, mocking students who say they're uncomfortable by those sorts of views, mocking the idea that academy, academics need to be shielded from racist or homophobic, or, they've all said no, the thing to do is debate them, allow these, these discourses to flourish. And here is the Washington Free Beacon now leading the lynch mob against these deans who are guilty of nothing other than having private text messages with one another that they deem to be insufficiently sensitive to the grievances of Jewish professors and Jewish students. Dr. Pashnik texted in a private message that one panelist was, quote, taking full advantage of this moment. Quote, huge fundraising potential, he wrote. Now, that's just a fact. Remember, facts don't care about your feelings. You're supposed to be able to state facts, even if it offends other people. That's what made Ben Shapiro a right-wing prophet, that immensely profound decree. And of course, it is a fact that many of the largest donors at all of these universities have been demanding and pressuring that the school crack down on Israel critics in the name of anti-Semitism. So, of course, it is true that the more that Columbia does that, it is used as a fundraising uh, opportunity. That's just a fact. It may make other people feelings hurt to point out that facts, but facts don't care about your feelings. 
Quote, later an alumna in the audience began to cry as she described her daughter's uneasiness as a Jewish student at Columbia. The woman said she had shared her daughter's, daughter's feelings with a representative of the University Development Office, which, by the way, is the office in charge of the billions and billions and billions of dollars of endowment that Columbia has and builds on. And one of the Columbia administrators texted, quote, amazing what money can do. That's it. That's what they were texting that caused them to be fired. Now, here is the free beacon. And the author is Aaron Sabarium, who I actually have had on my show before, in large part to talk about the dangers of cancel culture on college campuses. He's been one of the loudest people in media who has been denouncing this for many years. But he's a very vocal supporter of Israel and has now taken the lead in disclosing the bad acts that these administrators are doing that he considers anti-Semitic. So he's the one who got the, the photos of the private tax that someone took on the phone of, of these administrators, and he's the one who published it. Quote, Columbia administrators fire off hostile and dismissive text messages, vomit emojis during alumni reunion panel on Jewish life. Oh my God. Can you imagine the monsters who would fire off hostile and dismissive text messages and even use vomit emojis during a reunion panel on Jewish life? I mean, the law requires that if you're a school administrator, you sit respectively and deferentially when any Jewish student is talking and you don't disagree with what they say. You certainly don't mock it, even in private. That is not allowed. And yet these administrators were actually expressing hostile and dismissive text messages with one another and even using vomit emojis. Yes, I know sometimes this might hurt to hear, but sometimes people who are Jewish actually do say things that deserve mockery and criticism and even a vomit emoji, just like students of every other group might. Here's what the article goes on to report. Quote, the administrators, this is the article that got them reassigned and punished. Quote, the administrators included Joseph Sword, the dean of Columbia College. Okay, we went over that. Susan King Chim and Kristen Crum and Matthew Patchnick, uh, Patachnik, the associate dean for student and family support. Throughout the panel, which unfolded over nearly two hours, Cheng Kim was on her phone texting her colleagues about the proceedings, and they were replying to her in turn. As the panelists offered frank appraisals of the climate Jewish students have faced, Columbia's top officials responded with mockery and vitriol, dismissing claims of anti-Semitism and suggesting, in Pachnak's words, that Jewish figures on campus were exploiting the moment for, quote, fundraising potential. Quote, this is difficult to listen to, and I'm trying to keep an open mind to learn about the point of view, Cheng Kim texted Sorat, the dean of the college. Yep, he replied. The administrators expressed skepticism that Jewish students had experienced targeted, targeting or discrimination. As Massel, who published a news report in the Columbia Spectator about Jewish students who felt, quote, ostracized, was asked to, deal, uh, to dilate on, quote, the experience of Jewish and Israeli students on campus, Chang Kim fired off a text to Krom and Pachnik, quote, did we really have students being kicked out of clubs for being Jewish? The messages are not timestamped, so it is not always clear to what comments on the panel the participants are referring. In other cases, though, the references are easy to understand. At one point, Crom used a pair of vomit emojis to refer to an op-ed penned by a Columbia's campus rabbi, Johann Hein, in October 23. Oh, no criticizing or mocking an op-ed by a, a rabbi. That is absolutely, only an evil racist person would do that. You can mock a... Uh, op-ed by anybody else, an imam or a Christian leader or an atheist or a, a liberal or a concert, just not a rabbi, that will get you fired and exposed by the Washington Free Beacon, the Free Beacon, the Beacon of Freedom, the Washington Beacon of Freedom, titled, quote, Sounding the Alarm, the op-ed published in The Spectator expressed concern about, quote, the normalization of Hamas that Haynes saw on campus. Patachnik, the Associate Dean for Student and Family Support, also chimed in to say that one of the panelists, it is not clear to whom he was referring, is capitalizing on the crisis at hand to raise money. Quote, he knows exactly what he's doing and how to take full advantage of this moment, Patachnik wrote to Chang Kim and Krom. Quote, huge fundraising potential. Chang Kim responded, double R. 
Now, do I need to actually point out that it is a debate whether not Jewish students, but Israel supporters on college campuses, it's much different. There are a ton of Jewish supporters participating in and helping organize the protest against the Israeli war. They weren't mocking Jewish students, they were mocking Israel supporters. And on this show, I've constantly questioned and challenged the idea, as have guests, that there's some sort of anti-Semitism epidemic in the United States, that Jewish students on college campuses are uniquely endangered. There have been virtually no attacks on Jewish students of any kind. There have been a lot of attacks actually on pro-Palestinian protesters, but neither an epidemic of any kind. What these Jewish students are complaining about is that they feel like they're subject to hostility and being made uncomfortable because of criticisms of Israel, because of pro-Palestinian chants that they find offensive. And all we've heard for a decade from the American right, every part of the American right, is stop whining. You have no right to be protected from political expression that makes you uncomfortable. Everything is debatable, including race and gender and sex and sexual orientation and gender identity and immigration. It doesn't matter how uncomfortable it makes you. The point of colleges is to become an adult and, and toughen up and stop whining because you hear things that make you feel uncomfortable or even attacked. That's the whole argument of the left when it comes to people being censored for questioning gender ideology. It makes trans people feel endangered and incites violence against them. Same with the Black Lives Matter movement, demanding that people be fired for advocating certain views because it makes black people or black students uncomfortable. It's the same exact framework. You're allowed to question a rabbi's op-ed in the United States without being fired. You're allowed to mock or question whether anti-Semitism is being exploited to protect Israel or to argue that the concern about anti-Semitism on college campuses is being exploited to limit free speech and to crush dissent and criticism of Israel, something I've, I've many people have argued many, many times. And now the free beacon, the free beacon, the beacon of freedom is leading the way demanding that these college students, administrators, these administrators be punished. They're publishing their private tax and suggesting they're anti-Semitic and insensitive. Now, the Free Beacon and Aaron Severium have had a much, 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 much different position on very similar controversies, but that ones that did not involve Jewish students, but instead black students or trans students. Here, for example, is the Beacon of Freedom, the Free Beacon, Aaron Samarium, April 21st, 2023, so five months before October 7th. Quote, Stanford Law School's black students group will no longer help law school recruit minority students in the wake of Duncan Apology Group. In the way of Duncan Apology, the group decries, quote, scapegoating of diversity dean and white supremacist practices. Quote, the letter also aired a number of grievances that it said predated the Duncan incident. Stanford, the Black Law Association, uh, Students Law Students Association argued, has hobbled the group's ability to, quote, create a safe space for its members. So Stanford is making black students feel unsafe on Stanford's uh, campus, as they said. And despite black students, quote, free labor, the school's admission policy, quote, reproduce and reify white supremacy, classism, and colorism. Quote, based on the administration's handling of DEI, we unequivocally share a vote of no confidence in the current state of the administration's ability and willingness to adequately consider and respect the needs of black students and administrators. The group said, quote, we hope this letter will urge the administration to restructure its processes, lend credence to marginalized communities, and truly acknowledge and combat its practices of exploitation and domination moving forward. The exact same rhetoric we're hearing now, the exact same mentality, the exact same mindset that the right has mocked forever, for as long as I've been paying attention, now deployed, and not for the first time, it's been long deployed to protect uh, pro-Israel students and to punish Israel critics long before October 7th, but it's intensified greatly. Remember, the U.S. Congress summoned university administrators, administrators of private universities, to Congress to demand that they crack down on speech 
that people like Elise Stefanik and pro-Israel supporters in the Democratic Party believe crosses into the line of anti-Semitism. Imagine Congress summoning college administrators to demand that they limit speech about gender ideology or race and then invite a bunch of black students or trans students to testify about how unsafe they feel as they invited a string of privileged Jewish students at Harvard and Columbia and Yale to talk about how unsafe they were. Again, I mean, the hypocrisy, the stench of it is so sickening. I can barely stand it. And it's not just on college campuses. Here from the New York Times yesterday, a Wall Street law firm wants to define the consequences of participating in Israel protests. Sullivan and Cromwell, which was one of the biggest and most uh, influential law firms on the planet, based in Wall Street, is now requiring job applicants to explain their participation in Israel protests. Critics see the policy as a way to silence speech about the war, do you think? Here's what Sullivan and Cromwell is doing. Listen to this. Quote, Sullivan and Cromwell, a 145-year-old firm that has counted Goldman Sachs and Amazon among its clients, says that for job applicants, participation in a protest on campus or off could be a disqualifying factor. The firm is scrutinizing students' behavior with the help of a background check company, looking at their involvement with pro-Palestinian student groups, scouring social media and reviewing news reports and footage from protests. Notice that they're not trying to find instances of potential applicants participating in pro-Israel protests or anti-immigration protests or any other kind of protest. That's all totally fine. The one thing you cannot do if you want a job at Tullivan and Cromwell is participate in pro-Israel pro and pro-Palestinian protests or against the Israeli war in Gaza. That's the one thing that will get you disqualified from employment. And they're not just doing that to people who come and say, I participated in, and it's, they're scouring social media and looking for news reports to find and keep a list of the people who participated in report in protest against the Israeli war in Gaza or U.S. support for it and either refusing to hire them or forcing them into all sorts of extra additional required interviews for them to explain why they did that. Quote, the firm is looking for explicit instances of anti-Semitism as well as statements and slogans it is deemed to be, quote, triggering to Jews, said Joseph C. Schenker, a leader of Sullivan and Cromwell. They're not looking for any people who have said things that are triggering to any other minority group. Black people, Latinos, immigrants, LGBTs, Muslims, atheists. No, that's all fine. You can offend those groups as long as you, as much as you want and still get a job at Sullivan and Cromwell. There's only one minority group that you cannot offend if you want a job there. How is it that we constantly hear that this one minority group is the most vulnerable and endangered one in the United States when every single power center is not only on their side but acting with unprecedented force to protect them and to punish their critics? Seems kind of in conflict, these two narratives, that American Jews are uniquely endangered and marginalized and discriminated against, and yet every power center is acting aggressively to punish people who disagree with them. Quote, candidates could face scrutiny even if they weren't using problematic language but were involved with a protest where others did. The protesters should be responsible for the behavior of those around them, Mr. Shanker said, or else they were embracing a, quote, mob mentality. Quote, what's happening here is really just the implementation of basic workforce decency and standards, said Neil Barr, the chairman of Davis Polk, a global law firm employing more than 1,000 lawyers. Davis Polk rescinded job offers over students' involvements with groups that had released statements blaming Israel for the October 7th attack by Hamas. Sullivan and Cromwell's screening will take place after students apply for a job or arrange for an interview through top law schools, including Harvard, Yale, Columbia, and NYU. The firm has engaged a background check company called Higher Right to scour social media and recordings of public appearances for statements of act or actions about the conflict. Applicants will be asked to list student groups they have joined. Participation at a protest or involvement in a group that Sullivan and Cromwell finds objectionable will prompt questioning. Applicants will have to explain their role, including what they did to stop other protesters from making offensive or harassing statements. So if you went to a protest 
against the Israeli war in Gaza, which is your absolute right as an American citizen to do, and you just held an inoffensive sign saying stop killing innocent people or stop funding Israel's wars, and someone in that protest, that same protest, who you don't know, who you didn't see, said something that these law firms consider over the line when it comes to criticizing Israel, you'll be forced to demonstrate what you did to stop them from doing that in order to get a job there. And again, this is on top of all the other things that we've been reporting over the last nine months about crackdowns on people who are Israel critics. From CNBC in November of 2023, Wall Street Titans helped to fuel an Ivy League donor revolt. Quote, at least 400 Penn alumni and donors joined a recent call hosted by former class presidents and several speakers who said they were frustrated with the university's current leadership. Rowan was one of the final speakers on the call where he raised his own issues about the school. Beyond the calls with donors and alumni, Rowan and other financial executives critical of the universities have been in contact through their messages about their concerns with the school. One of the people on these text messages chains with Rowan is Bill Ackman, the billionaire CEO of the hedge fund Pershing Square. Rowan and Ackman are not alone. Investors David Magerman and Leon Cooperman have also said they plan to stop donating to their preferred universities to protest how the schools have responded to the war in Gaza. So on one hand, it's an anti-Semitic trope that can get you punished or fired if you're an administrator speaking in private to say that obviously these kinds of events where the school demonstrates its protection of Jewish students and their limitations on Israel criticism have a don't fundraising aspect to them. That's an anti-Semitic trope. And on the other, all sorts of pro-Israel billionaires have been out in the open blackballing students who participate in criticism of Israel and withdrawing their billions of dollars of support for universities unless they prove they're willing to crack down on students who are critical of Israel. Again, I mean, I thought the whole point of the right was that you should not, not only do you have the right to, but you have the duty to state facts even if it upsets people. It's clearly true that one of the main reasons that these universities have cracked down on criticism of Israel is because their biggest donors have been demanding that they do so. Not all of them, but many of them. And of course there's a financial and fundraising component to what these universities are doing. And it is inane to say that there's something anti-Semitic about pointing that out simply because in this case, the students involved are Jewish or pro-Israel. Now, the civil liberty group FIRE.org, which gained a lot of credibility and popularity among conservatives for the years spent defending conservative students who were targeted with censorship on universities for right-wing speech, is one of the few, maybe the only consistent free speech group in the country. They will defend anybody regardless of political ideology, and they've repeatedly spoken out since October 7th on the dangers of this trend of punishing Israel critics. And here they, is what they said on April 17th when the congressional hearings were held on, quote, anti-Semitism. Quote, we watched today's congressional hearing on anti-Semitism. Here are our big takeaways. Columbia lead, Columbia's leaders told lawmakers they're investigating or have already disciplined multiple students and faculty for what appears to be speech protected by the university's policies and commitments. FIRE is looking into these alarming re revelations. As always, FIRE will defend any student or protester investigated or punished for simply exercising their right to free expression or academic freedom. Columbia's leaders said calls for genocide would violate university policy, but there are good reasons why the First Amendment and Columbia's substantially similar free speech promises generally protect even, quote, calls for genocide. Remember, if you have a law or a rule that prevents advocacy of genocide on a college campus, you can easily see that being applied to either side. There are a lot of critics of Israel, a lot of people on the left, a lot of anti-Israel uh, activists who believe that the genocide that's being committed is by Israel against Gaza. In fact, not just activists who believe that, there are major countries in the world like South Africa and others who have taken that position legally in court that Israel is guilty of genocide. So if you have a rule on college campuses that you can't advocate what's considered, quote, genocide, that means that if you stand up and defend Israel and defend the Israeli war in Gaza, you could be punished or censored or expelled for, quote, advocacy of genocide. And then, of course, 
You could also, if you're a critic of Israel, be accused of advocating genocide by simply advocating that there should be full democracy between the river and the sea, where every person has the full and equal right to vote, because that would basically result in the elimination of a Jewish state once there's an Arab majority. We don't have a hate speech exception to the free speech clause. We don't have a genocide exception to the free speech clause. And if you want to have a hate speech exception or whatever, a genocide exception, then don't come whining to me or anybody else when people are expelled from school for anti-trans speech on the grounds that that incites a genocidal violence against trans people because you've already said that you believe in that framework. Now, just to give you an example for how the American right has talked about students until October 7th, when they completely changed their script, but how they always used to talk about students who demanded protection from offensive speech or upsetting speech or demanded safe spaces on college campuses, just as one example, here is Fox and Friends on January, in January of 2016. And the headline there is trouble with schools, meaning that the trouble is that all kinds of students and minority groups and marginalized groups are demanding speech limitations in the name of protecting them from violence. Here's how Fox and Friends used to talk about this before October 7th. Ask any college students, should you at your university have a rule banning offensive speech? 51% say Yes. But oh, my God, those crazy leftists, those evil leftists who want speech codes on college campuses, 51%. Fox News is indignant and frightened. And yet Fox News has cheered every single time that a student group has been closed or a Israel critic has been expelled or punished since October 7th because now they're the ones that want speech codes. They just wanted to protect the one group they care about. But here they were in 2016. Look at this. The, there's these crazy, insane, tyrannical leftists who want speech codes on college campuses in the name of being protected. Next guest says if these students want a safe space, they should just stay home. He's also the author of a brand new book, Abraham, the world's first but certainly not last Jewish lawyer. Alan Dershowitz, welcome back to the show. Longtime professor at Harvard University, uh, Harvard Law School, and who's uh, the perfect person to answer this question. What happened to our college campuses, Professor? Well, they became places where people are afraid of ideas. They, they think they know the truth. And they have ideas. Oh, they're afraid of ideas. And they, here's the graphic they on the screen. The perfect person answer. Don't go to college. Just stay home if you want a safe space. Obviously, they weren't talking about Israel supporters there. They were talking about black students and LGBT students complaining that there were views that were being allowed on college campuses that made them uncomfortable. And their idea was, look, toughen up. If you don't want to hear ideas that make you uncomfortable, stay at home. Don't go to college. College is for adults. You don't have the right to be protected there from ideas that make you feel endangered. That's what the whole segment was, mocking these college students. Here uh, from uh, Ben Shapiro, he delivered a speech at the Young Americans for Freedom. They're for freedom. Ben Shapiro's for freedom. And therefore, he spoke at the Young Americans for Freedom conference because Ben Shapiro's for freedom in November of 2015, and the topic of his speech was college students who demand that speech be limited or speech be punished if it makes them uncomfortable. And the title of his talk was, because Ben Shapiro's like a tough guy, he's like really been through it all, and he's like never complained or whined or anything. It's, quote, toughen up, spoiled children. So Ben Shapiro was calling college students spoiled children who wanted speech codes were whining about feeling unsafe on college campuses. But now if you call Israel supporters that, spoiled children, it means that you'll be fired for, quote, anti-Semitic tropes. So you're allowed to say this. These children are spoiled. They're privileged. They're wealthy. They should stop whining about any group we want, except one, the one that Ben Shapiro happens to identify most with. Here's the incredibly tough and pro-liberty and pro-freedom speech he gave about college students in 2015 in doing his or her bad thing. And all colleges do now is give people reasons to feel like they are justified in doing the bad things that they want to do. Because once you've been microaggressed, once you've been microaggressed, once you're part of the self-designated victim group, driven to extremes by the evils of white privilege, you can now ban white students from black safe spaces. Right? You can, black, you can ban them, which, by the way, is a policy the KKK loves, because the space is both separate and equal. 
right? You can have that. You can call the cops. You can call the cops. You can have the police investigate hateful remarks, as the notice went out from MU. A couple. So, if you're a member of a self-victimized, uh, self-identified victim group, you can even get the FBI or the police to investigate hateful speech. This is all that people have been calling for after October 7th, call the police on pro-Palestinian protesters, have the FBI investigate them, put them in prison, because they're offending, in the words of Ben Shapiro, a self-identified victim group. Of course, everything changes once the victim group is Ben Shapiro's own. A couple of weeks ago, it was heavily covered. I tweeted out that everybody should immediately call the cops and inform them that, that Professor Melissa Click was engaged in microaggressions against people and actual aggressions against people. You can ban reporters from public spaces by calling for muscle. By the way, why Melissa Click is still employed at this university is absolutely beyond me. There is no way in hell anybody should be paying this salary. Once you're microaggressed, you can deliberately assault reporters, as we saw happen on, to, to at least a couple of reporters. Uh, and, and again, the, I, I have to tell you, the strategy that, that these protesters are using, this constant, you hit yourself strategy. And if you watch the tape of, of the reporter who is trying to get into uh, the safe space, the magical safe space, the, the coveted utopian safe space, um, <laughs> he's standing there with the camera, and all of the kids are saying to each other, and, and one of the professors is saying to them, you know, just move up, just move, let's march forward. Let's march. And the, 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 the reporter is literally just standing there. They bump into the reporter with him standing there completely immobile, and then they start yelling at him about how he hit them. And the Remember the one time that there was supposedly a documented case of violence against a Jewish student? They finally found the case. Barry Weiss was so excited. Her website promoted it so aggressively because a Jewish student got stabbed in the eye they said, with a Palestinian flag, invoking this image that, like, she was just standing there and somebody came up to her with, like, a, the, the sharp end of the flag and just stabbed her in the eye a bunch of times. And then Mike Johnson went the next day to the Holocaust uh, Memorial Museum, and he claimed that Jewish students, plural, were walking around being stabbed in the eye by Palestinian flags, like it was some kind of, like, trend or epidemic. And then the whole thing proved to be a Jesse Smollett-level hoax, when this Jewish student who was stabbed in the eye did this massive media tour the next day, and there was absolutely nothing wrong with her eye, it didn't even have like a little redness, like a little pink eye, let alone having been stabbed in the eye. And they asked her like, well, what are your symptoms? And she's like, yeah, I just basically have a headache, a light headache. I had a light headache. Because it was a hoax. It was a lie. They had video of it finally emerge, and there were Palestinian protesters walking by her. She was provoking them very close to them, and they were all waving their flags, and one of them brushed up against her with the flag, and she claimed she was stabbed in the eye, and Barry Weiss and all the Israeli fanatics promoted it. We finally got an example of a student who was victimized by violence. They were all screaming anti-Semitism, and it all turned out to be a hoax, exactly like Ben Shapiro is claiming that other minority groups do. It's just childish behavior. It's just, this is spoiled brat behavior. You can excuse pastors being punched inside the free speech zone, right? You can do anything. Once you've been microaggressed, microaggression gives you superpowers. And the beauty of it is that you give yourself the superpowers because you're the one who determines whether you've been microaggressed. You don't even have to show proof that you were microaggressed. You were because you feel it deep in the cockles of your heart. Oh, wow. So apparently people who claim they're being microaggressed who are members of minority group get superpowers as a result. For example, like getting three, two different university professors fired for allowing too much anti-Israel speech on college campuses, for getting major law firms to ban the hiring of anyone who participates in a protest against the Israeli war. These are superpowers that you get if you are claiming to be microaggressed or somehow offended by speech on college campuses. Ben Shapiro hates that. His message for them is toughen up, spoiled children. Has anyone in that realm of the American right, the pro-Israel right, said anything like this in response to Jewish? No. In fact, those college administrators are basically saying about these Jewish students exactly what Ben Shapiro has been saying about black students and, Islam and uh, Muslim students and LGBT students for a decade. You become a hero on the American right if you mock 
those kind of grievances from any other minority group, but you become an anti-Semite who must be fired if you express the exact same thoughts, toughen up, spoiled children, when it comes to Jewish or pro-Israel students. So finally, all of this, the white privilege, the microaggressions, this provides the impetus for the safe space, the vaunted safe space, which I know I have violated multiple times tonight. And I got to tell you, I don't give two hoots in hell. The, the system is so corrupt, it's so inescapable, and you've made it so corrupt and so inescapable to yourself that when you need a safe space, everybody needs to be put outside the safe space, and reality must not intrude. The South Park song about safe spaces is exactly what these people think. All these pro-freedom advocates who believe so much in freedom cheering this idea that if you want a safe space on college campus, if you're complaining that you feel unsafe, it's time for you to, it means you're in a bubble, it's time for you to go outside and all these pro-freedom people are cheering Ben Shapiro. And let me tell you something about safe spaces. There's only one group of people, one group of people, who want safe spaces that are race specific. There are only one group of people that want safe spaces so that they never have to hear from anybody of a different ideology or political persuasion. Those people are called fascists. Okay, and you've got a bunch of fascists, damn fascists on this campus who are trying to shut down political debate and trying to cloister themselves in this little cocoon of stupidity so they don't have to debate anyone or think about issues outside their kin so that they can feel comfortable. Guess what? Life isn't about feeling comfortable. Life is about bettering yourself. Get off your ass, you stupid pansies. Get off your ass, you stupid pansies. Ben Shapiro has been through it all. He's so battle-hardened. He's sickened by the idea that students would whine about feeling unsafe on college campuses because of having to hear uncomfortable ideas. These are fascists, he said. There's only one group of people who do that. They're called fascists. They're pansies. Ben Shapiro is sick of them. They need to toughen up. They're spoiled little children. For saying far, 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 far less than that about pro-Israel students, literally crying are having their parents come and cry about how traumatized they are for hearing criticism of Israel that makes them uncomfortable. Columbia student uh, administrators were reassigned or punished while the beacon of freedom, the free beacon, led the way in tattling on them and cheering their punishment. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.